Ukrainian war expert Marty J. Kari's 2018 video has become a big hit over the Internet. It has been viewed over 1 million, 600,000 times until May 27, 2022. In it, Kari reflects on the Russian mental landscape and why Russia is attacking Ukraine. This is an interview with Marty J. Kari, retired colonel of military intelligence, who teaches intelligence analysis in the master's program in security and strategic analysis at the University of Djibouti. A skill, eh? Welcome, Marty. Thank you. You know Russia very well. Did you expect this attack on Ukraine on this scale? At a time when Russia began concentrating troops on the Ukrainian border, I estimated that Russia's goal is to put pressure on Ukraine to accept the Second Treaty of Minsk. After Macron and Schultz went to Moscow and then to Kiev to talk, apparently to persuade Zelensky to reopen the second agreement in Minsk. However, they did not succeed. At that point, I started thinking that something bad was going to happen there. But could you imagine that on this scale? Actually, I did not. I thought that if Russia uses armed forces in Ukraine, then Russia will do it with the lowest goals. I mean that Russia is trying to expand its rebel areas and maybe then conduct an operation in the Kharkiv region. What are the reasons for Russia now to attack Ukraine so massively? I interpret Russia's actions through Russia's strategic culture. I see that it is precisely behind this that Ukraine is important for Russia historically, politically, militarily and emotionally. Historically, it has been part of Russia. The Russian state was born in Kyiv. So what Putin is saying is that Russia was born in Kyiv and Kyiv is important. But especially militarily, because Russia has often been attacked through Kyiv. Russia's problem is that Russia has no defensive natural borders to the west, no seas, no mountains and so on. During the Soviet era, they formed a defense with the Warsaw Pact. And because the Soviet republics, the Baltic countries, Belarus and Ukraine were like a secondary defense zone. When the Soviet Union collapsed, both of these defense zones disappeared with the exception of Belarus, at which point Russia feels that this threat has reached Russia's borders. And because there are no terrain to defend or protect the borders, Russia fears a NATO military attack. You are talking about the Kremlin's neurotic attitude towards the West and the world in general, about the huge sense of insecurity the Russia has by nature. Yes. United States ambassador to Moscow in 1946. Kennan sent a famous long gable in which he used the term neurotic attitude feeling insecure. That is, he described how the Russians view the Western world. The Russians feel that the Soviet Union and now Russia, who is the heir to the Soviet Union, is a besieged fort that is always being under attack. That is, there is such a concept in their cultural heritage that someone always attacks here. The Mongols are attacking here. Napoleon is attacking. The Germans are attacking, the Swedes are attacking here, the Finns are attacking here, and so on. Now NATO is attacking here. The Kremlin leadership should tell such a narrative because it is like a way to stay in power. Yes. You are also talking about the principle of constant war. War must be kept at a low level all the time. Not so much in Russia, but in the surrounding areas of Russia, in the neighboring areas, and on the other hand here in the cyber environment and the information environment, there is talk of a so-called hybrid war. Russia is waging an extremely skillful hybrid war against the Western world all the time. What are the signs of this hybrid war in Finland, for example? The impact of information is strong. Cyber attacks take place sometimes. We had a hockey team that played in K8L. The term is so-called soft power. Our aim in Finland is or was to get a Russian nuclear power plant. We are being tried to be dependent on Russian energy. We have corrupt prime ministers serving in Russian companies. That is, on every broad front, there is influencing, sorry, I mean the ex-prime ministers, not the current prime minister of Finland.
In the old way that we cannot clearly say that we are underarmed or other attack. But it happens all the time. You have said that there is also a media in Finland that knowingly or unknowingly plays into Russia's back. What do you mean by that? Yes, we use, for example, the Russian vocabulary of information warfare. I have two examples. I gave an interview to a national radio program where I listed examples of information influence. Nuclear power plant, hockey team, corrupt prime ministers and so on. The radio station cut off the corrupt prime minister from that program. I complained about it, which resulted it being returned to the original format, especially when I was able to claim that it is directly from the European Union report where two corrupt ex-prime ministers were mentioned by name. <laughs> Then, another example. Yeah. I was in an interview with a magazine where a reporter talked about NATO hawks, a term used of pro-NATO people. Mm. I don't like my name and the word NATO hawk appearing in the same interview because the term NATO hawk is a word for Russian information warfare. I didn't even know that. Well, yes, it is. It is much used. That's what I mean. It's so very common. Just like that. And we do not notice that we are repeating Russian words of information warfare. It's interesting. One thing which you have been talking about a lot. Russia is a very authoritarian culture. Putin is an authoritarian dictator in practice. He has a very strong position there in Russia. Why are the principles and presidents in Russia so strong? The Russia as a country was born in Kyiv. Kiev, Russia was democratic. There was a Vechid meeting where people voted and so on. The Vechid bell called people to the market and voted there a bit like in Athens before. The Mongols once conquered its territories. The Mongols were absolutely autocratic. Genghis Khan and other Khans were extremely autocratic. They brought an infinitely autocratic principle to Russia. They also brought a culture of corruption and violence and a culture of taxation and taxation. All of these came to Russia through the Mongols from the 1240s onwards. Russia was later kind of liberated from these Mongols. It was not those Mongols who left but they merged with the population in the late 14th century. That is, this Mongol culture stayed there in Russia. When Moscow gained power, just as authoritarian autocracy moved there to Moscow to the prince. It was not the Tsar yet but the prince. After the fall of Constantinople in 1453, the seat of the Eastern Roman Roman Church moved to Moscow, and it kind of united. Earthly and heavenly power united and the Tsar gained power as if through the Church. Which means that the Tsar is the infallible autocrat. He is infallible because he has received his power from God. That is, if you go to challenge your administration or leader, then you are challenging God. Probably no one should challenge God. After that, it was as if this absolute autocracy, which had been obtained from God, was institutionalized. It institutionalized in the Romanov family and continued until that time under communism. Communism has the same features. Their religion was replaced by communism. The Tsar was replaced by the general secretary of the Communist Party, who has gained power from communism. If you challenge a leader, you challenge communism, that is its idea and you re-in trouble. Now it's exactly the same thing. Putin's popularity has been enormous. But what is it at the moment? How strong is Putin's popularity right now in Russia? It's really hard to say what that Putin's support really is right now. Because these measurements are also potentially manipulated. Yes, the Russians have a very strong ability to endure suffering. You have also said how the Russians have made suffering a virtue. They consider suffering a virtue. 
How is this situation now when the West imposes sanctions on Russia? How does this fit into the situation? How much sanctions will the Russians accept and how well will they endure it? The story in Russia goes that these sanctions in Russia are due to the evil West. The good Tsar has fallen victim to the evil West. His people are also suffering from it. Kiev with such a nazi regime. A good Tsar is going a fair operation against it, Kiev nazi regime. Not a war, but an operation. But the West does not understand this, or the West wants to support the nazi regime in Kiev. Because of this, sanctions have been imposed on Russians. The story is turned upside down. Let's see how long the Russians can endure this. In other words, it may take a very long time. It could be. What is this Nazi card? When we talk about the denazification of Ukraine, why are they talking about the Nazis? Because when Germany invaded the Soviet Union during midsummer in 1941 and conquered Ukraine, among other places, some Ukrainians supported the Germans because they wanted their country free. Part of the Ukrainians were on the German side and they were supported by the Germans. After the Soviet Union conquered or liberated Ukraine back, there was a strong resistance movement in Ukraine that the Soviet Union fought until the 1950s. They were called Bandera. Stepan Bandera was their leader. Nazi has a very strong negative connotation in the Russian language. That is, if you want to stigmatize someone, then the Nazi is the best word for it. Yes, they are waving Nazi cards regularly. So how do the Russians react to reality and truth? The difference between truth and falsehood. Is it a little different than in Finland? Yes, there are many truths in Russia. Russia is an interesting country. Only this moment is true. History is changing and the future is plural. That is, it is an extremely interesting country. The concept of truth and falsehood is very different from ours. They operate between truth and falsehood, or between war and peace, in several different layers of gray. In exactly the same way, they are also between truth and falsehood, significantly more gray layers than we have. The so-called tactical truth. Tactical truth. In other words, should we believe anything Putin is saying at the moment? Can we trust his word? At the moment, I would not trust so much to Putin's words because especially now March 9, 2022, that this situation is what it is. He is somehow trying to get out of this trap. He probably uses tactical truth relatively much because it goes like this. Goebbels said, Lenin said that when a lie is told enough times it becomes truth. And if for nothing else, at least to the home front he has to tell the lie 1,000 times for it to become a true. What does Russia want from Ukraine? What kind of peace terms could Russia agree to? I believe that Russia is working for a condition of peace that Ukraine will not move to the West. Mm. That is a guarantee that Ukraine will not go to NATO, for example. Yes. But can Ukraine promise such a thing? I believe that Ukraine is fighting precisely because it has the right to decide whether or not to join NATO. How long do you think Ukraine will continue that fight? Now the West is not going there to Ukraine to fight, but the West is arming Ukraine. The West is arming. The volunteers are coming from the West. Yes, at least according to public sources, this balance of the fight seems to be turning in that direction at the moment, that Ukraine will be able to stop the Russian invasion. South Ukraine, where the Russians are likely to gain a land access, Russia has gotten it from the rebel zone in Crimea. It is possible that they are also trying to break the land connection from Crimea to western Transnistria, which would mean that the whole of Ukraine would be isolated from the sea. Russian offensive has gone worse in this war than imagined. So why is that? Hasn't Russia put all the volume in there? When I teach at university, I teach intelligence analysis. We use as an example of the failure of reconnaissance, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. 
Israel had defeated the Arab world in the 1967 Six-Day War. For the Israel, the myth was born that the Israeli soldier is unbeatable and that the Arabs are not competent in a modern technological war. Russia, when it occupied Crimea and took over the rebel territories. The Russians must have had a sense of feeling good that they are superior to the Ukrainians. However, this is eight years since the Crimea was conquered. Ukraine has built up its defenses. The behavior of the Russians in both eastern Ukraine and the occupation of Crimea has also increased the will of the Ukrainians to defend themselves. I believe the Russians counted wrong, or else the intelligence has failed. Or the customers of the intelligence, Russian high command, have not understood or wanted to understand what they are being told about the situation in Ukraine. What does it mean that Russia has apparently put 100% of the forces it has in Ukraine into this fight now? It says that Russia is serious. Russia is setting up more troops. Now it looks like you are looking at pictures on social media. Looks like second-tier vehicles, civilian trucks, and the like are being taken there. Not all vehicles are green anymore, but other vehicles are also taken there. Last week, there were reports that martial law was coming to Russia, which would then allow for mobilization but this has not yet happened. No, I expected the same. But the law came out there in Russia about this war censorship. What if you tell the unofficial truth in public? If you tell something other than the Kremlin's truth about things like war, you could get up to 15 years in prison. This caused the last free television and radio channels like Dost and Ekomosfi to close their doors because they could not be sure whether they would be sued with the news they were carrying out. And now it is said that Russia would be leaving the Internet as well, completely. Not at all at this point. The day before yesterday, March 7, 2022, the Russian Ministry of Communications instructed all the Russian administrations to transfer all services from foreign clouds to Russian clouds and move to use Russian services and ensure that the FSB, the security service authorities, have access to the facilities where Internet traffic to abroad can be cut off. However, Russia is not yet in a position to completely disconnect from the Internet as their oil and gas revenues, Spurbank, Bank, among others, and other banks through which this energy is traded, are in the SWIFT system for international money transfer between banks. And as long as the SWIFT system is in place, Russia is unlikely to be able to completely disconnect from the Internet. So what are Russia's reasons for disconnecting from the Internet? Of course, the fact that citizens do not see Western information. But is Russia, for example, planning a cyber attack? It can be. We also have good researchers in the Finnish Defense Forces who evaluate it when Russia breaks away from the Internet. So this seems to form such a good attack vector against the global Internet. On the other hand, it protects its own Internet from attacks from outside its Russian segment. It is a component of both defense and offensive. Of course, also cutting off the flow of information. In other words, Russia will become the Soviet Union 2.0 in terms of the information environment. The Iron Curtain is dropping. What kind of cyber attack could Russia carry out? It can target military targets, it can target energy distribution, or it can target banking systems. However, a cyber attack is meant to destabilize the West. What is the worst-case scenario? The worst-case scenario is that we will soon have no Internet, but it is almost tantamount to using nuclear weapons. I don't think so. Would the Russians have a chance to carry out such a blow? Yes, they would. Yes, the United States protects its own Internet. The second is that the communication gables are physically cut. After all, the communication gables from Norway, Svalbard, to Norway were already cut off. A few miles of gable disappeared from there, 
and no one knows who did it. The Russians have a submarine capable of doing this. That is, in principle, cyber attack could also be done physically, kinetically. That is, physically disconnect the communication gables. 80% of Russians receive their information through television and the television channels there are, of course, fully controlled by the Kremlin. What does it do to the nation's mental landscape? Goebbels and Lenin said. When you tell a lay a thousand times, it becomes true. What we've been watching is pretty outrageous about what's coming from there on Russian television. That's where this nazi card revolves, how the Ukrainians crucify children, and how the West is trying to invade Russia and so on. The West is planning an invasion of Russia. They will liberate Ukraine. Yes. It is a special operation that is going on there in Ukraine. How could the West get through this information wall? South Korea is sending North Korea balloons with inscriptions, but that won't work in this case. We get towed by reporting the facts mm. and hope that some Russian will always find those facts. How does Russia now think about its northwestern neighbors? For example, from Finland, are we in the uh, Russia a NATO country? Or are we a new country or are we a neutral country? When the Russians talk about us, they use the word neutral country in information warfare tactically. That is, they therefore seek to feed us to our language the word neutral. Mm -hmm. Although we are not neutral, we chose our side in 1995 when we joined the European Union. That is, we are part of the Western world. But Russia is trying to feed the story to its own citizens that we are a neutral country. So officially, indeed, the Russians think that we are a country through which the St. Petersburg and Murmansk regions are facing an armed threat, an armed threat posed by NATO, or an armed threat posed by the Finns. In other words, in their operational plans, we are already a NATO country. What is Finland's position in Russia's neighborhood in this situation? We have a neighbor like that who is completely unpredictable. It can do anything. We plan and reflect. We currently have a public debate on joining NATO. What is our position now in relation to Russia? Our position in relation to Russia. We are Russia's border neighbor. We have a strong defense. We have a functioning intelligence and we have a wise state leadership. So we are not in trouble here. If we want to improve our position even further, then, for example, an alliance or strengthening the defense, for which the best solution is an alliance, it increases our security. So joining NATO is the solution. I myself am in favor of joining NATO. I am a cadet of YYE Treaty, the Finno-Soviet Treaty of 1948, an agreement of friendship, cooperation, and mutual assistance. I was taught that neutrality is the only solution. In a cadet school in the 1980s and learned the YYE Treaty by heart. That is, if West Germany or a German only invades Finland or, through Finland, the Soviet Union, Finland is obliged to defend the Soviet Union and so on. It was memorized. I then served in the NATO operation in Bosnia in the early 2000s, seeing what NATO really is. NATO is not the aggressive bloc that was taught to me in the 1980s. I understood it. I secretly became a supporter of NATO. Because I was in state office, I could not comment publicly on what I thought about it. At the end of 2017, when I retired from active service to the reserve for the Finnish Defense Forces, I started speaking out for NATO membership. Because I understand through my own old profession. In 30 years of military intelligence, I understand how Russia really sees Finland. These are things we, those who have served in the Finnish Defense Forces, are not allowed to talk about exactly, but which affect my thinking. Because I know what the truth is there behind Russia's actions. If we are already a NATO country in their eyes and at the moment we are getting all the weaknesses of NATO membership but no benefits, then I do not understand why we would not only. But how likely is it that Russia will somehow respond to that Finland's NATO membership? Now Putin, 
Russia has threatened Finland with countermeasures, military sanctions if Finland joins NATO. Military technical. For example, military technical means grouping troops at the border. There are troops on our eastern border already. Military and political, yes. That is, units are grouped. Do you believe that Russia would attack Finland if we were to join NATO? That's not how it goes. It is intellectual dishonesty to think that we cannot join NATO because between the moment we submit our application for membership and NATO reads our application for membership, that Russia would attack. Of course, this will be ensured so that we already have security guarantees at the stage when we formally submit the application. The admission decision for NATO has already been played in when we submit the application officially at the time of application. In fact, we probably now already have some sort of extended security guaranteed by NATO against Russia. What do you mean by that security guarantee it could be? The United States, for example, can guarantee, just as Sweden had throughout the Cold War. Sweden had such a special relationship with NATO. In other words, do you think that the United States has already guaranteed security for Finland for the time before officially joining NATO? It can be. Why has it not been said in public? Why has it not been said in public? I don't think it needs to be said in public. Because we have a functioning and strong defense, a functioning intelligence and a wise state leadership. So I think it's the wisdom of the state leadership that everything is not said in public. Just like in playing the checkers, you should not show the last card right away. How likely do you think Russia will attack Finland someday in the next few years if we are not members of NATO? Russia's decision to attack or not to attack Finland depends on their operational needs. The other is that they estimate how expensive it would be. There is currently no operational need. But I don't think we should think about waiting for that operational need to arise and only then join NATO. So what can Finland do? In other words, to join NATO. Own a strong national defense and join NATO. Let's talk about Putin for a moment. How do you view the president of Russia or the dictator of Russia, Vladimir Putin? Is he no longer a rational actor? Or is he irrational? Does he work in this world anymore? He's been pretty isolated here for a few years now. We have to remember what his background is. He is a KGB officer, meaning he is the epitome of Russian culture. He thinks specifically that a fort has been drawn, a constant war and a constant threat of attack and so on. He really thinks about it. And the people around him are educators of the same school, Petrushev, Bortnikov, Ivanov and so on. That is in the Kremlin high command lives of strong bias. That is, when they discuss there in the Kremlin, they have a strong confirmation bias with each other that NATO is trying to attack here to Russia. But the fact that here in the West, when we think about whether Putin is crazy, those individuals who estimate that Putin is crazy do not understand Russian strategic culture. Instead, they ponder Putin's actions through the Western decision-making process. No, he's not crazy. He may be a little unbalanced. He is a bit impulsive. However, the imbalance and impulsivity have remained, at least for the time being, within the limits set by Russian culture. Because if Putin's behavior would differ significantly from what the Russian culture, that inner circle, the boyars, tolerated, he would have been moved aside. How do you think Putin and those close to him feel about this situation? There are boyars, oligarchs, with huge fortunes that are now frozen. Oligarchs abroad lost a huge amount of money. They see the rubble collapse and the economy collapse. So at what point will Putin's inner circle have had enough? It probably has two stages where something can happen. 
When the Russian system works so that as you move forward in the administration, you will always receive higher share of the corruption. Those who are all up on the top there have a huge share of corruption. They have tens of millions relocated to the West. They have put their children to the West. All their kids are studying in the West. They have good lives in the West. Money is in the West. Now that that money is taken away, and the son calls the father, Dad, give me the money. And the father says, I don't have the money then. At that point, Dad starts thinking, which one do I have to be loyal to? My own family or Putin. It's like the first step. Boyers, or Putin's inner circle, has had enough of its own misery. Or it isn't misery because, yes, they have arranged it so that there is always money somewhere. They have to give up that luxury. That is some reason. And another reason. We talked about nuclear weapons earlier. Another reason may be that soldiers who understand the horrors of nuclear war can intervene in the situation if Putin's actions look like the president is planning to use a nuclear weapon. He is not the only person who decides on the use of a nuclear weapon. That includes Shoigu, the commander of the defense forces, chief of staff, Gerasimov, that is. There are three people in it who decide to fire. Well, do you see it as a big threat for them to use nuclear weapons? I do not believe that. I think one of the three. Or, in fact, it is not Gerasimov, but it is the command center of the armed forces that is on duty there. So I think there is a wise enough person in some of these three who says we are not going to start a nuclear war, or two out of three, or even three out of these three. What is Putin's mental landscape at the moment? Has he been showing this possibility of nuclear weapon? In his memoirs, Putin talked about the rat he was driving into a corner. That rat anxiously attacked him. I thought then. However, why he tells in his memoirs about such a rather small thing. Before it flashed to me now. He usually tends to warn. I noticed that this was probably related to him warning. If a rat is driven into a corner, I don't mean he's a rat, but usually if someone is driven into a corner then he will even bite to get himself out of the situation. I wonder if the nuclear weapon is Putin's bite with what will he get out of the corner. But then I think more that it might not be that nuclear weapon. It's something else. Putin says in his opening remarks on Feb 24, 2022, that they will respond in an unprecedented way. Nuclear weapons have been seen in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It could be a cyber attack. Because no big cyber attack have ever been seen. As I pondered this, it became known that Russia was tightening the security of its own Internet. Or it could be something else. You said that a cyber attack could have an effect almost like of a nuclear attack. What could it bring? What kind of effects? Imagine a situation where the Internet stops working. All communication ends. Everything. All systems run out through the Internet nowadays. Everything is controlled. Communication via the Internet will end. It doesn't have to end permanently. A day or two is enough. Or the payment systems will stop working for two days. Quite a lot of cows. Is there a possibility of such cyber attack from Russia? Basically, yes. Maybe also in practice. There is expertise. And capacity, too. They are good at it. We talked about of Putin's inner circle. How likely do you think there would be a palace coup there in the Kremlin? When someone has had enough? I do not know. At some point the boyers have to make an account of who they are loyal to. For himself and his family or for the Russian people. The people in general have been outsiders in palace coups. Or loyal to Putin. For example, Khrushchev was ousted in 1964 in the way that Brezhnev went to his dacha and announced that 
Now it happens that you leave the keys with us and no need to come to work on Monday. <laughs> Gorbachev was in Crimea in a Dacha when Yeneyev's group seized power in 1991. After that, Yeltsin also seemed to seize power from Gorbachev. There are such traditions of the palace coup in Russia. How likely do you think this would happen now? When I served in the intelligence, the best word for reporting probabilities was possibly, meaning 50% yes, 50% no. Yeah. What do we know about how strongly the Kremlin leadership is behind the use of force in general? This type of what is currently happening in Ukraine. Civilians are being bombed. It's a little tricky question. Before the war broke out, Narishkin, the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service, went to the speaker's stand saying he supports, or he used these words, a Russian language that is extremely rich with two aspects. A near future tense, which says what is going to happen, and present tense. He went there to the speaker's stand and used the future tense term. I will support the annexation of these people's republics rebel areas to Russia. Putin got nervous about this and said we re not talking about it. But do you support the independence of these people's republics? Narishkin went one step further. He used the Russian future tense. I will support their annexation into Russia. Putin said, we are not talking about that now. We are talking about declaring independence to the people's republics. This indicates that the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service at the Security Council meeting does not know what is being talked about. How much they on different levels of Kremlin leadership actually know what's going on anyway is a mystery. So we can't see how strongly they are behind the warfare that begins to resemble partly in part a war crime. Marty J. Kari, how can Putin be stopped? What does the West needs to do? The West must be united. In any case, the West must not show weakness. Because Russia believes in power. Russia believes in power. We need to be strong. We need to be united. We need to support Ukraine as much as we can. Hasn't the West done just that? Yes. We are doing just the right thing at the moment. All that support what we direct to Ukraine needs to be done. However, so that NATO does not get involved in that war as NATO. Because that would be a risk of nuclear war. What kind of future scenarios do you see here now? What is going to happen? There are probably alternatives that Ukraine will be able to defend itself in such a way that Russia will agree to peace talks. Without absolute demand to surrender. And that Russia will start negotiating on the angle that Ukraine also has a say. Another option for this situation is to freeze so that Kyiv becomes like Sarajevo 1992-1996. A besieged city, although it is not currently besieged yet. The third option is for the war to continue and continue. The fourth option is for something to happen in the Kremlin that will allow the Kremlin to end the war. Something. How likely do you think the war will escalate from this to other countries? I don't think anyone would. It is not in anyone's interests for this war to escalate. NATO is expectedly extremely careful that the war would escalate between Russia and NATO, because then the genie is out of the bottle. Marty J. Kari, thank you very much for a very interesting interview.